Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back. We are still here on the Pan African Tech Foundation West Africa Bootcamp, and our theme for this one is digital transformation and the adaptation of emerging technologies in West Africa. And your host today is me, Lydia Charles Moyo. I have got Tete Coffee here, but he's also not. Uh, he will join us in the other sessions. So welcome everybody. Um, Previously, we had our first session, which was around introduction to blockchain, and we had a, an amazing trainer, Eric Anan, and he took us through the journey and how we can all benefit from the blockchain uh, uh, benefits. So now we have to go to a second session, and before that, if you're here with me and you are excited, please go to the emoji part and then um, give me a thumbs up. You know, the emoji part. Show, give me a thumbs up, yes. Uh, or give me a clap to show that you are here with me. Yes. Just to remind you how you can navigate through uh, AirMeet. Um, if you are a speaker, there's a place you can turn on a video or and turn it off. There's a place you can turn on your audio and turn it off. Uh, there's a place where you can do an emoji uh, of showing how you're feeling or how you get, you're getting the training. And if you are here, there's another part where you can chat. Please tell us more around what you learned from the bootcamp. What do people know or what do you understand about artificial intelligence? So yeah, welcome again. Uh, uh, we're so happy to have you here. And we are going straight to our second session which is Introduction to Artificial Intelligence and its Uses in the West Africa. So our, our trainer, our trainer is Dr. Tunde Adegbola. I'm sure, I don't know if I was able to pronounce this right, but he's our trainer for today. Just a little bit of brief about him. Uh, Tunde Adegbola is a research scientist, consulting, engineering, and a culture activist. He holds a bachelor uh, in electrical engineering and a master's in computer science and a PhD in information science. As executive director of African Language Technology Initiative, Ebadan, he leads a team of researchers in appropriating human language technologies for African languages. He taught artificial intelligence and automated reasoning at the University of Lagos from 2008 to 2019. And he has been teaching same subjects in the University of Ibadan from 1990 till date. He's also coordinated the development of course material for the master's and PhD programs in artificial intelligence for the national opening University of Nigeria. He has also set up new as well and enhanced existing radio and television stations in Nigeria Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, as well as Sao Tome and Principe. Uh, I think I've said much. Uh, so now I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Tumbe on the floor. And yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen so uh, you can see my illustrations. Yes. Can you see my screen? So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. It's something that uh, I believe in Africa we need to get more and more acquainted with. And let me acknowledge the last speaker for the passion with which he has spoken and for the um, zest for Africa's development, uh, the zest for Africa's development that he demonstrated and the clarity with which he push, pushed the case. Thank you very much. Um, artificial intelligence, I am going to try to give a panoramic introduction. Artificial intelligence is not something we discuss in, on an afternoon, one hour, one afternoon. It's a really, really big thing. But I'm going to try to give a panoramic introduction such that we have uh, enough information to be able to make decisions on what to do about artificial intelligence. First of all, in order to be able to talk about artificial intelligence, the first thing we need to be able to do is to be able to define artificial intelligence. I don't think we have much problem defining artificial. It means man-made, made by human hands. But intelligence is a problem. The question is, what is intelligence? Is a rather bewildering 
question. There are various, there have been various efforts to define intelligence. They have at best been feeble. Uh, recently, there was a, 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 an argument between uh, psychologist Howard Gardner, who had in the last 10, 20 years proposed a notion of multiple intelligence. And uh, Jordan Peterson, another psychologist of, of repute, has come out to say the whole idea of multiple intelligence does not really live up to the promise it seems to give. So there we are. There's this problem of defining intelligence. Because intelligence is a complex phenomenon that encompasses various abilities. For example, the ability to apply knowledge, the ability to analyze and interpret, the ability to adapt to situation and to adapt the environment also. So in short, we may not be able to define intelligence precisely, but we have always found it easy to identify what we may refer to as intelligent behavior. That is, even though we cannot uh, define intelligence, but when somebody behaves intelligently, we can easily say, wow, that was intelligent. So even though we cannot define intelligence, we can at least relate intelligence to this behavior can say are motivated by intelligence. So, from that point of view, we can say that artificial intelligence is a quest to make computers behave in such a way that we will say they are intelligent. That is to make computer put up intelligent behavior. Before we go further, talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence, let us note that the whole issue of intelligence is wrapped around another issue, and that is the issue of information. What is information? I do not seek to define information at this point, but I want to describe its value. Information is you make sound decisions and take appropriate actions. Whenever we make a decision or take an action without information, we are more likely to get things wrong than get it right. So basically, the problem we have is how do we make decisions and take actions? So we find that a lot of what we are using intelligence for is to acquire information to be able to make decisions and take actions. So the question now reduces to, how do we know? How, when, when, we, when, when you take a decision based on some information, the question can be asked to you, how do you know? So that question, how do you know, is an often asked question. And it's usually asked to explain decisions and actions. Now, the most basic way we know is by encounter The situation, so you know the situation. So when we deal with encounter and recall, we are therefore um, getting information from what we recall from what we had seen before. So the most basic way of getting information is by encounter and recall. For example, for example, when you say, ask a young person, two times two, he immediately says four. That information was got from uh, encounter and recall. Because the person had once before encountered the, inf the, the information two times two and knows that the answer is Now, a problem with knowing through encounter and recall is that there is too much 
to know and recall. There is far too much to know and recall. Uh, because our, our memory system is limited. It means, therefore, that we cannot always know, we cannot recall everything we need to know. And that puts our strategy of knowing by uh, encounter and recall in a bit of jeopardy. Meaning that if we cannot remember everything we need to know and recall, then we are having some problems with how we know. So we must therefore take account of the fact that we may not be able to know everything we need to know merely by encounter and recall. And that is why we use books. A lot of what we cannot remember, we put in books. We retain in books. And we just use the books to remind ourselves of what we ought to know that we do not know. So, you will now find that whatever you do, your book will always out remember you. Remember uh, what is taught. Because whatever you put in a book just stays there. And you are able to get back at it anytime you want it. So your book always remember more than you. And in computing, we have used the uh, approach of databases to replicate, encounter, and recall in computers. Now, in order to solve the problem of not having enough memory to encounter and recall, we sometimes know by calculation. So I asked earlier on if we look at the problem 2 multiplied by 2, we give the answer immediately it is 4. But if you are asked the question 573 times 758, you probably will pause. You probably will uh, look at a, 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 um, a ready recorder or try to use a calculator or uh, count uh, use counters, uh, soroban, or abacus. Just find some way to get around it. So here now, we have seen that because we cannot remember everything that we need to remember, we can use some other devices to know beyond just um, uh, encounter and recall. But calculation in the sense we are talking here is limited to numeric manipulations, and it requires some algorithm or the other. And the computer achieves this just by doing number crunching. And what we have said now, the two ways we've talked about, both encounter and recall, and calculation, they are the forte of traditional computing. Traditional computing does this very, very well. But neither of them require intelligence. Remembering does not really require intelligence because if remembering requires intelligence, then the book is more intelligent than the person who is reading the book. Uh, calculating does not require intelligence. If calculation requires intelligence, even the mechanical adding machine becomes more intelligent than the human being. So we need to look carefully at that. Now, when we look at data, we are looking at raw facts and figures that express some state of reality. That's what data is. When processed, data becomes more expressive. It becomes more informative. And that is why we refer to information as processed data. We process data into information. Now, having talked about data and information, what next comes to mind is, what about knowledge? What is knowledge? The English language sometimes presents a bit of difficulty because the word knowledge is derived from the word know. And sometimes we may mix up the word knowledge with the word information. They, they are not exactly the same. Knowledge has to do with something 
deeper than information. So, if we are looking at data and information, and we say that information is derived from data, we can also say that knowledge is derived from information. And we can easily define knowledge as applied information. Or in order to be able to uh, operationalize it, we say knowledge is information plus the rules of its application. Rules, very, very important. Pre-AI, before the time of AI, computers remember and calculate. Basically, a computer is basically a CPU and memory. They store and process data into information and that data must be structured. If the data is not structured, pre-AI computing cannot deal with it. They store and manage the data and the information in databases. For example, the database access, the popular uh, database that comes with Office. On the other hand, we use algorithms to calculate with data to produce information using arithmetic and logic. Arithmetic being the process of adding numbers, subtracting, dividing, and multiplying. And logic, the process of looking at values and seeing whether one is greater, whether one is smaller, whether the two are equal. So with those two, with arithmetic, the adding, subtraction, uh, multiplication and division of numbers and logic, the comparison between numbers, we are able to achieve a lot in, uh, in what we do. But a lot more is required. Human beings do a lot more than arithmetic and logic to make themselves uh, success, successful in the world. We use, we use common sense, we use general knowledge, we use instincts, and these are facilities that till now are not available to computers. The question then is, can we make these facilities of common sense, general knowledge, instincts, feelings, uh, consciousness, and all that, can we make them available to computers? So what we're talking in this sense, therefore, is if we have said that we have data, we have information and we have knowledge it means therefore that we are trying to make a transition from just data and databases through information to knowledge and knowledge basis so with so far in computing the database is a common uh, phenomenon people talk about databases but less people talk about knowledge basis. So when we are looking at artificial intelligence, we are not just looking at computers as databases for the recall of encountered data or encountered information. We are now looking onto computers to offer knowledge basis through which we can derive knowledge that we do not already have. And there are three main challenges of artificial intelligence. The first challenge is that of knowledge representation. How do we represent knowledge? We know how to represent data. Um, com computing has really, really become comfortable in representing data, it's become comfortable in representing information. But how do we represent uh, uh, knowledge. So that's the first, that's first question. The second question that artificial intelligence seeks to solve is how do we acquire knowledge? We know how to acquire data. We do surveys, we uh, insert probes, we install cameras, we, we, we uh, acquire data from that. But how do we acquire knowledge? The question of knowledge acquisition. And thirdly, the, uh, the fundamental problem of artificial intelligence is how do we use knowledge? When we have knowledge, 
how do we really use it? How do we teach the computer to be able to use knowledge? Now, we've talked about data, we've talked about information, and we have talked about knowledge as applied information or information with the rules of its application. To make it a little more um, plain, we can look at knowledge as the relationship between objects, their attributes, and the values of individual attributes. So, for example, when we say a green Volkswagen car, we are talking about an object, the car. We are talking about one of its attributes, the color. And we are talking about the value, green, attached to that color. By that time, we are now beginning to talk more about relationships than just cold, raw data processed into information. We also can represent knowledge in frames, put a number of uh, values together relating to one particular object or logic, the process of uh, the facility for reasoning. And we talked about rules before, and the, 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 the idea of rules will keep reoccurring, I must say. Now, we said earlier on that we were not able to define intelligence. But we were able to relate it to certain categories of human behavior. Which means, therefore, anything we are trying to do with intelligence, we have to relate it to the human being. So, in order to understand intelligent, intelligent behavior and also give capacity for, to the computer to be, behave intelligently, we need to try and understand how human beings behave intelligently. Human cognition is a facility that makes human beings behave intelligently. So, in artificial intelligence, we seek to solve complex problems in more human-like fashion. We always use the human being as our standard when we are looking at problems, we want to use artificial intelligence to solve because of this idea of intelligent behavior as our basis for assessing intelligence. Now, if we look at human beings, therefore, and we want to look at their human, their cognitive system, we find that humans engage the environment by virtue of sensation, perception, and cognition. Sensation basically is the excitation of one of the human's senses by some kind of stimulus from the environment. When you hear a sound, your sense of hearing is stimulated. When you see a flash of light, your sense of sight is stimulated. When you perceive an odor, your olfactory senses are stimulated, and on and on and on like that. So, as humans, we sense our environment. When we sense our environment, we process what we have sensed, as it were, data, and derive information from it and give some kind of interpretation to what we have sensed. So if you smell some kind, if you perceive some kind of odor, and you say, hmm, this smells like burning rubber. Right, so we're talking about human cognition that because we say that the, the way we are engaging intelligence is by looking at human intelligent behavior. So we want to look at how human beings behave intelligently. And it comes from human cognitive facilities. So humans sense the environment. When they sense the environment, they, it's like acquiring data for the environment. Then they process the data and the, pro the process data provides some information which gives some interpretation of what was sent. So in that sense, when you uh, perceive an odor and you feel it's like smelling uh, rubber, then you will look around and see 
did somebody leave uh, a plastic container near the cooking fire or something? Then the total cognition, which is the next sensation, perception, and cognition. Cognition is the totality of the process of sensing, the process of perception, the process of interpreting and using the information that you have acquired. So we see there that we have covered the whole um, a continuum of data, information, and knowledge because we acquired data from our senses, we processed it through our perceptive processes, and we interpreted and applied the knowledge to uh, take uh, decisions and do something. Now, cognition is the core of human intelligence. And cognition is based on concepts and propositions. I will explain. What is a concept? A concept basically is a mental representation of a class of like objects. What do I mean by that? As human beings, we do not see the world as consisting of objects. You may think when you look at the world, you are seeing a collection of objects. But the human being in the process, in their cognitive processes, do not see the world as a co collection of objects. We see the world as a collection of concepts. And I said that a concept is a mental representation of a class of like objects. When you, for example, when you think about the idea of bird, basically that thing we call bird does not exist in real life. It exists only in the human brain. What exists is a particular bird. When you talk of dog, dog is merely an idea. What exists is a dog with a particular name, with a particular, with a particular owner who lives in a particular house, which barks when he sees people. So, but in order to be able to deal with the number of things we need to remember, we bring together lots of objects and deal with them as concepts, as the concept. So we therefore view the world as a, as a collection of concepts rather than as a system of objects. These concepts are either groups, classes, clusters, or whatever of objects that have common characteristics. So we do not look at the world as individual objects, but as collections. And I, like I said, a concept is a mental representation of a class of like objects. I said earlier on that cognition is based on concepts and propositions. So now that we say cognition is based on concept or proposition, we have explained the idea of concepts as a class of like objects. What then is a proposition? A proposition is a statement that links two or more concepts. So if, for example, when we say birds fly, Bird is a concept. Flight is a concept. Why do I say flight is a concept? Remember that birds fly, arrows fly, aeroplanes fly, darts fly, even paper aeroplanes fly. So the concept of something moving in the air is what we refer to as flight. And we bring it all together under a concept. So when we say birds fly, we have made a proposition. And that helps us to learn without having to recall everything we have encountered. Because we group them together and we're able to deal with them. Now, that is how human beings deal with the problem of multiplicity of things to know. Can we make the computer deal with the world in a similar way? 
rather than with as a collection of objects, but as a collection of concepts. So what we are looking for is machines that reason. We are looking for machines that reason. Reasoning is the process of drawing logical inferences. When we look at certain situations and we are able to draw inferences from the, that situation, we say we are reasoning. Reasoning engages the faculty in contrast to the senses. Earlier on, we talked about sensing uh, our environment, uh, perceiving, and engaging our cognition. But when we come to the issue of reasoning, we are no more engaging uh, uh, our senses. We are not engaging our feelings. We are not engaging our desires. We are engaging our faculty, our inner mental cognitive system. So we see that reasoning comes more from within than without. What we sense is coming from without. But reasoning, come, reasoning comes from uh, within. Reasoning involves the reflection over alternatives. We look at various alternatives. We evaluate them and determine which one is better based on what we refer to as a process of generate and test. And when we say we are thinking, we are actually reasoning about something definite. Thinking is, can be described as the act of reasoning. So in this sense, therefore, in order to be able to reason, there is a need for understanding. And what do we mean by understanding? We are able to, we are able to see things beyond being mere objects. We said earlier on that the concept is a mental representation of a class of like objects. So if we have an object, if we have a concept, and we are able to we are able to look at it as a concept, then it means we can get more from that class than we can get from the object. Let's take it for example. You come across an object that has wings, it has feathers, it walks on two, it's got beaks. You can Based on what you have seen, based on what you know, you can classify that object as a bird. Now, because you have classified that object as a bird, you can assume that that object has various other attributes that it has not displayed yet, but that are consistent with birds. So you can assume that hmm, very, very soon, this object would lay an egg if you are able to determine that it's a female bird. So when somebody, when a poultry farmer goes to buy day-old chicks, the reason that poultry farmer is buying day-old chick is because from the information that is available that this object has beaks, it has feathers, it has wings, it walks on two, it is a bird consistent with chicken, one day is going to lay eggs and I can sell the eggs to make money. So that poultry farmer has derived information that is not immediately available from the characteristics that are consistent with that class. So that is what we mean by understanding, reasoning, and making inference of unknown information from known information. Reading is realized in computers. We say that how can we uh, achieve this kind of uh, uh, behavior, intelligent behavior from computers? And we can do that by making computers such alternatives. So in a nutshell, AI is giving machines knowledge and understanding, the ability to develop complementary 
instructions and rules for the appropriate application of available information. So you get some information, you know what it takes to expand or extrapolate the available information to get information that is not there and then uh, available. AI also involves the representation of knowledge as distinct from the representation of data and information. AI involves the acquisition of knowledge beyond obtaining and processing data into information. AI includes the use of knowledge, the application of logic to infer the unknown from the known. And in uh, modern day computing, in modern efforts in artificial intelligence, we have been able to realize these in three primary ways. One, by employing such algorithms to contemplate alternatives, by employing logic algorithms to infer unavailable information from available information, and by employing learning algorithms to imitate the process of understanding by getting computers to learn input-output relationships, cause and effect relationships, learning them as embedded rules rather than acquiring these rules from people who know. But we get the process, we get the computer to learn the rules automatically. So let's look at, we said there where we talk of search algorithms, logic algorithms, and line algorithms. Let's look at search algorithms. Traditional computer player apply specific uh, algorithms to specific problems. In fact, it is interesting to look at the computer. In you see, the computer is the first tool made by humans, in which the maker of the tool cannot determine its use. If you, if somebody sells you a knife. The person who made the knife is suggesting what you should do is use it for. If a person offers you a car, the person who made the car has suggested what you should use it for. If a person sells you uh, a, a coat, he has suggested what you should use it for. But the computer is the first tool made in which the maker cannot determine its use. That is because the computer's comes to you first and foremost as a general purpose hardware whose use will be determined by some software or the other. And this software applies specific algorithms to specific problems. But now, in the age of AI, there is a trend. Just as we have moved from specific tools, specific hardware tools, the general purpose hardware tools whose uh, behavior is defined by software. We have now also moved to an era of general purpose algorithm whose behavior is determined by data. And like I said, there are three basic uh, algorithms. Such algorithms which involve generate and test you generate a solution to test whether it is appropriate for what you want. And in the process of generating and testing, because there are lots and lots and lots to generate and test, you find some ways to contain the problem of generating so many useless options. Second, we have logic algorithms. Algorithms that look at if, then, situations. In this case, we are not looking at if-then situations in which you have a clear idea of the conditions that will determine the if. That we, are, we, that we engage every time we are, we are writing programs, writing software for computers. We say if this, then. Knowing the uh, uh, result or the input that will go into that if. But many times, we don't even know what uh, the options are, and we don't know what, if, even if we know what the options are, we don't know what subsists 
making it difficult for us to pick an option. So, in that, in such case, we revert to search. So we got to look and look and look and look and search all the possibilities and see the one that is most uh, appropriate. Of course, trying to make this search as parsimonious as possible. And finally, we have learning algorithms, which is the most important approach to artificial intelligence today. That is algorithms that learn categories. We said earlier on that humans think conceptually. We do not deal with the world as a collection of objects, but as a collection of concepts. So our learning algorithms are algorithms that learn to put objects in categories, classes, in clusters. So that is the first type of learning algorithm. Another type of learning algorithm is what we may call carrot and stick algorithm. That is algorithms that assess a situation and if what they have found, if the approach to the assessment is positive, they award some credit for that process. But if the result is negative, they reduce they, they award a negative reward for that process. So when you have a number of various processes, you are able to define a policy that will always give you maximum reward. So that is what we refer to as carrot and stick algorithms. Normally, they are called um, uh, uh, reinforcement uh, algorithm for reinforcement learning. in uh, learning algorithms is to acquire tools by which we can guide the behavior of the computer based on so there we are that's where we are in the world of artificial intelligence today let's look at some examples of uh, searching as reasoning Let's see the little uh, sum we have here. We have the sum A plus B is equal to C. A plus B is equal to C. If we Sorry. look at the situation well, there are two possibilities. A plus B may be equal to C, or A plus B may be equal to C plus 10. What do I mean by this? If A is 3 and B is 4, A plus C will be 7. If A is 5 and B is 6, C will be 1. If A is 7 and B is 8, then C will be 5. In the situation where C is was 1, actually A plus B was 11, but we carried 1. So in that case, we know that from the problem we have here, there are possibilities that A and B add up to a number less than 10. But because in this problem, we have the answer as A, C. It means that the problem is not one in which A plus B add to less than 10. Because that A can only be one. We can only carry one. Now, if we say, we, therefore means that A plus B is equal to C plus 10. Now, since A and C are not the same, then A plus B cannot be 11. Now, we know that we can only carry one. And since A, which is next to C, has the value, if we assume this A has value one, because this A also is one, it means they both, because this is also A, the two of them must be one. 
which means therefore there was something here to which we added one to give a number different from one and the only possibility there is that a is one b is nine c is zero and we get that the answer is a plus b is equal to c which is zero plus 10 which is still 10. so that is a process of there is no known mathematical uh, uh, analytical approach to solve this problem than to search for the results but it could get more difficult let's look at this for example the problem is we have s e n d m o r e when we add e to d to e n to r e to o s to m we end up we end up with m o n e y so can we solve the problem? Can we solve this problem such that we find what S is, what E is, is, what N is, what D, R, E, and all of that? Now, we notice that when we did the first problem, there were two possibilities here. A plus B is either C, or A plus B is equal to C plus 10. In this case now, we have a whole tree. So we start from uh, the E plus D. E plus D can either be uh, y or y plus 10. So this is the option when e plus d, e plus d plus e is y plus 10, and that's the option when d plus e is y. And we go down that way, we go all the way down until we come to just the um, situation in which the whole thing is consistent. And the answer we get is this, in which D is 7, N is 6, E is 5, and S is 9. Now, you see that, that the E here also is 5, same as the E we had above. R is 8. Hello. Uh, o is 0. M is 1. And it's consistent with this M. This O is consistent with this 0. And on and on, this E is consistent with this 5. So... What we have done here is we have solved the problem by searching. And that we do a lot of in artificial intelligence. Now, uh, this is our former president. These are two uh, Nigeria former presidents playing the game uh, Mankala, which is very, very popular African game. Now, the kind of search we have done here, if we intend to search, if we intend to implement it on Mankala, you get a kind of very, very deep search. Popular African game, if we look at the uh, plane of Mankala, we start with 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, then you pick one, you possibility of picking one goal and play. We can pick the second goal, we can pick the third goal, these are all the possibilities. As you come down there, you see that more and more uh, possibilities are created to the extent that by the time you get to a depth of six, you have 46,654 possibilities. Excellent. Dr. Tunde, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. But you cannot hear me. Okay, we've been trying to get your okay. attention. For... Oh, I didn't hear. Okay. Uh, do you want to say something to me? Okay, so go ahead, Lydia. You, you wanted to say something. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, I can. Okay, because I've been struggling talking. I wasn't sure if you can hear me or not. No, I wasn't hearing you until now. Okay, doctor, can you like wrap up? Because I would like to, to welcome as uh, Modupe to come and you two to have a conversation. So maybe if you can finalize okay. your presentation. Okay, thank you. So we have situations in which, in which things grow so fast that it's just impossible. So what we then have to do is find ways by which we can uh, make the machine learn. We can make the machine learn the rules. And this is where we come into this concept of perception in which we try to make machines mimic the way the human brain works. Uh, this is the way the human Hello. brain is organized, and these are artificial yeah. versions. Yeah. Am I, I, 
Uh, is somebody trying to get my attention? Hello? Hello? Lydia, we can still hear you. Okay. She's muted now. You can just continue, sir. Oh, thank you. So, um, this is the artificial version of the biological neuron. It's an artificial neuron. So, we, um, we use this kind of arrangement to make machines learn. This is what we refer to as a neural network in which we put many neurons. Each of these um, circles represent single neurons which we put together, which by the time we put some inputs And more, we have found better and better ways of organizing this input out to situation, which leads to what is getting really, really popular now as deep learning. Um, then we talked about, I talked earlier on about reinforcement learning, which I refer to as carrot and stick learning, reward and punishment learning, in which um, the computer is made to learn what is appropriate and what is not. Um, then there are one problem that is now imagine having done all this with AI is a situation in which we have buyers in which the uh, computer systems we are having are behaving in such ways that put some people in bad light. For example, if you if you Google grandma, this is what you will get, and none of this grammar looks like mine. Neither this. And when I kept trying, well, I found one grammar that looked like mine, this one. But guess what? What it says is that grammar was tasered by police. So the only grammar that looked like mine that I found on the internet was tasered by police. Well, I kept looking and I finally got a positive image of a grandma, a 77-year-old grandma that graduated from the University of Lagos in Nigeria. So the point I'm making here is that if we are not careful, artificial intelligence may reinforce existing uh, preconceptions and negative biases. And we need to look very, very carefully at that. Now, what are the application areas of artificial intelligence in Africa? In my own work as a language technologist, we have used artificial intelligence to do automatic speech recognition, ASR, in which a person speaks now I'm talking of basically African languages and the computer writes what is said. You present written text to the computer, text to speech synthesis and the computer reads it out. Machine translation, you get the computer to translate from one African language to the other. And this is, uh, the, uh, in doing all this, you have to be very, very aware of tonality because our African languages are tonal. Uh, when you apply tone to a word, it will mean something else. So you have to take care mm -hmm. of that. So when we have that kind of situation, can we still talk about technology transfer? Certainly not. We are now having to solve problems that are uniquely ours. So we cannot go and we cannot transfer such technology. We must develop such technologies locally. And that is why I'm, I, I, I felt gratified that a, 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 a program in artificial intelligence was pre uh, presented in today's uh, boot camp. We have applications in agriculture. Uh, we, can, we can program drones to recognize ripe, uh, ripened uh, tomatoes and use those drones to pick them. We can use tractors to harvest tomatoes. They'll just be crushed. But we can program drones to recognize ripened tomatoes. We train them using artificial intelligence. We can use artificial intelligence in business, in customer relationship market uh, management. We can use artificial intelligence in data, uh, and the whole idea of data accumulation comes in because you cannot do good artificial intelligence without data. There is a problem at the moment in Africa. A lot of our data is not accumulated. We 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 we, we do not use facilities that automatically or uh, as a kind of byproduct gather data. We need to address that in order to be able to use artificial intelligence. In short, okay, uh, you can say that artificial intelligence offers productivity 
for the enhancement of Africa's development, and we should embrace it. As we go into the future, thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tunde, but I think because we, we are still on the stage together, I would just like to invite Modupe and you two, we'll have a conversation uh, all right. because this is of my time. Last slide, this is my last okay. slide. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would like to take this opportunity. First of all, let's clap for Dr. Uh, Dr. Tunde, thank you for a great presentation. I'm sure... Uh, let me see you on the emoji part. You're giving me a thumbs up. You're giving me a clap. Yes, that was great. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Modupe uh, to really have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Tunde. Modupe is an African lead for the Global Blockchain Women Alliance. She's also a certified trainer and training consultant. She sits on the board of Global Humanity Initiative, and she is a member of African Business Integrity Network. She is passionate about educating Africans, especially women in technology, especially blockchain. So she is very passionate about what we are speaking about today. And maybe let me take this opportunity to welcome our on stage. And yeah, I hope you have a great conversation with Dr. Tunde. You're welcome. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks, Dr. Tunde. It's been really amazing listening to you, really. And, you know, the world of technology and how far um, it has gone in Africa is actually quite enlightening because um, some people from outside the world may just sit there and think nothing is really happening. Well, the PATF is here to prove that something is actually going on in this sector at the moment. So just a few questions, you know, um, I know thoughts that have been going through the minds of people. And in most of my conversations around artificial intelligence, most times people want to know. I guess it's also probably because um, in Africa, we're a bit conservative in um, our interaction with technology. So one of the questions I get asked the most is, is AI going to take over the world? Is it going to take over our jobs? Already, we don't have enough jobs in Africa. So people want to know, is AI going to take over the world or take over our jobs? What do you have to say, sir? Well, let me start by saying that it is not even a manifestation of African conservatism. It is a valid, natural propensity for everybody in the world, all over the world. People fear about whether uh, AI will take our jobs. Uh, yes, AI will take our jobs. But <laughs> if you remember, at the dawn of the industrial age, the fear was that machines are going to take our jobs. But at the height of the industrial age, the problem wasn't unemployment, it was child labor. There was so much to do, they even needed children who wouldn't have worked to work. Children were made to go and clean chimneys because they were small enough to go in chimneys and sort things. So yes, there are lots of things that human beings do today which I believe are below human dignity because humans have a greater capacity, have other capacities to do more important things. And I believe that as we adopt more and more of technology, particularly as we adopt more and more of artificial intelligence, it is going to open new vistas, new opportunities for new jobs that human beings will take up and the mundane things that human beings were doing, which in some, uh, uh, in some circumstances will be looked at as probably uh, disguised unemployment, then we find that human beings are now doing things that are really worthy rather than things that are just keeping them uh, uh, expanding. Right. Thanks. Thanks. To that answer. I think that that takes me to the next question. Um, you know, you said a lot about so a particular statement you made. I wrote it down. You said cognition is at the core of human intelligence. And you also took some time to elaborate on what the core of artificial intelligence is. But there's also this concept that I, I got to find out on that AI and the concept of AGI, which is Artificial General Intelligence. And I wanted to know, are we there yet? Or how far are we from getting to that point where 
machines begin to almost act like humans and do virtually everything that humans can do. Hmm. The whole concept of artificial general intelligence, uh, we refer to it in the uh, field, uh, tongue in the cheek, as we are looking for one person that knows everything rather than looking for everybody that knows something. And it is going to be a lot easier to aggregate everybody that knows something than to find somebody that knows everything. Now, the artificial general intelligence is a kind of golden, uh, where, where, the, 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 the ultimate that humans are uh, aspiring to. As that today, we do not really have a clear understanding of how to achieve artificial general intelligence. In fact, apart from a lot of the successes we've had in recent times in artificial intelligence, one of the most problematic aspects of artificial intelligence is how do we deal with the concept of common sense, which humans use the fact that there are certain things that are known. I mean, so some people have tried to build machines that are generally intelligent, and sometimes by the time they try it for two, three hours, there will be an element of common sense that is needed that has not been put in yet. And if you put that in, you try again, then another element comes on. So how human beings manage to be intelligent about certain basic things that cannot be easily quantified is still a mystery. I don't belong to the class of people who say never. I never say never, but we are still a long way away from artificial general intelligence. What we have been able to do now is we have been able to develop very, very powerful systems that are able to solve specific problems, but with general purpose software. It's an indicator, but we are not there yet. Okay, great. Thank you, Isa, for that answer. Okay, so finally, I would like to just ask, um, there's another terminology that almost always appears alongside AI, and that is robotics. So people say artificial intelligence and robotics. So what's the difference or what are the similarities between artificial intelligence and robotics? The, the, the very, very important intersection between robotics and artificial intelligence is that robotics involves moving uh, artifacts and we apply artificial intelligence to bring about intelligent motion in robotics. So robotics mm. itself is just making uh, gadgetry that can assist human beings. But we need some right. elements of intelligence in robots to behave like human beings behave. So robotics itself is not artificial intelligence, but there are elements of robotics that depend on knowledge of artificial intelligence to achieve intelligent motion. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time, sir, for the training. That was really enlightening. There's still so much we need to discover. And definitely no class on AI can be taken in an hour. We, there needs to be so much more personal study that we do. But we thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with us. It's been really enlightening. And I'm sure everyone on this call can see the same. Thank you, thank you very much again, sir. Um, okay, so Lydia can take it away now. Thank yeah, you very maybe much. just Thank to you. give you an opportunity to share with you like the one minute. Anything you'd like to share before we close and go for a break and come back for the third one. Okay, so I think what I really want to talk about because while the field of artificial intelligence is extremely interesting and you know um it's the backbone of a lot that is going on in the technology sector right now. Um one of my passions really is blockchain. Um and for blockchain it's about letting the world know Eric did amazing. And I remember I said to Elaine that the passion with which he communicated was just so, 
was what we need to get the message across, really. And so um, one of the things I do is increasing the involvement of women and girls in the blockchain space, you know, getting people to understand the intricacies of the technology beyond cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies are great, but beyond cryptocurrencies, getting people to understand enterprise blockchain, tokenization, the digitization of assets, and how that can be useful to us in Africa as individuals. We have um, the unbanked people of the world, two thirds of whom are in Africa and you know, the Southeast Asia as well. So getting these people to come on the technology and to learn how to use it. In Africa, this is one of my passions. So um, anyone else can connect with me and um, this is what I do. So that's all, thank you. Ash, thank you so much Modupe for sharing uh, such an exciting uh, message with all of us. And thank you so much Dr. Tunde, you have shared a lot of things. I can see people have been commenting on our chats, you know, and they are all like waiting to have the slides and they're saying uh, this has been an great session. So I just want us to clap for Dr. Tunde and Modupe. Please give me a clap on the emoji side. Give me a thumbs up. You know, and if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A. We are ready. And if you have any comments, any message, whether the thoughts that you've catched from this session, please share with us uh, in the chat. Also, your personal experience with artificial intelligence. We would like to also know how is it your end? How are you been? How have you been working on this uh, on this matter? Uh, other than that, I think it's about time we have like a short break. We're going to have a very short break of ten minutes. Uh, meanwhile, you want to connect and network with Dr. Tunde and with Modupe and the previous speakers, just please go around and network on the tables. Also get your water and, you know, stretch a bit and be ready for the next session because it's going to be powerful and exciting. Uh, until the next session, uh, bye.